Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with you all today, practicing together. Today, I'm going to talk about the koan, Who Am I? And my first experience with this koan was in a fairly unlikely place, uh, 57 years ago, actually. And it was in a uh, Protestant church. I was in Sunday school. And uh, I get to Sunday school, and, and basically at Sunday school, I wanted to play with my friends and do stuff. I wasn't particularly into having any great spiritual awakening. Uh, but this uh, opened up a little lesson for that day. And at the top of the page, it said, um, who am I? Who am I? And so my uh, Sunday school teacher, really nice guy, Mr. Boardman was his name. He said, so uh, we're going to be talking about who am I today? Anybody want to uh, kind of tell, tell uh, th what, what they think about who am I? So I'm thinking, okay, really, I want to get back to, uh, to doing playing stuff here as quick as possible. And I think I got this one. So I raised my hand and uh, Mr. Boardman called on me. And I said, okay, who am I? Well, um, I'm Kent Brown. I live on 4214 Southwest Altadena Avenue in Portland, one, Oregon. That was before we had zip codes. It's now 97201. Uh, my brother's Brent. My dad's actually the minister of this church. His name's Harold. My mom teaches at Portland State University. She teaches English. Um, her name is Alberta. My favorite sports team is the Oregon State uh, Beavers. Uh, don't like the Oregon Ducks. Love the Oregon State Beavers. I uh, love playing all sports. Go to Robert Gray grade school. My teacher is Mrs. Craig. That's pretty much it. And uh, it was almost like, you know, and today they didn't use that expression back then, but inside I was kind of doing like, yes, you know, nailed it. But uh, anyway, um, as I reflect back on that, a couple things. First of all, as a 10 year old, I didn't think about, well, wait a minute. What about when my dad or mom go away or, or die or divorce, or I'm no longer at Robert Gray grade school? or for some reason I'm not living in, in Portland, Oregon at 4214 Southwest Altadena Avenue. Then who am I? But you know, give me a break, I was 10 years old. I didn't think that way. But, and, and, I, and I would also say that I would never have believed that 57 years later, because uh, I'm, I'm 67 now, that I would still be completely, I have this a continuing focus of my life, this, this koan of who am I, right? It is my life. And, you know, this koan, I know a lot of you have worked on it. You know, it's not a, it's not a koan you just study and, and tick, it off the, tick it off the list, you know, when you, when you pass it and move on. It's way more than that. And, you know, it, it's who am I? It's what am I? It's what is this going on here? You know, what's the reality? What's the, the here and now reality? What's the totality? You know, what is it? What is it? What's this? That's what's going on, right? What's life? What's death? What's the nature? What's the nature of, of, of mind, the nature of heart, right? So it truly is the, the koan of, of life, this, this very life, this very life, including right at this moment, right? And each of us have a chance this week to go deeper and deeper into this koan, deeper than we've ever gone before. You have an amazing, we have an amazing opportunity to practice. And you think about what had to happen for us even to be here today. First of all, we have these two amazing Roshis that are very, very patient. They use all kinds of uh, upaya in order to try to uh, help us see more clearly, point us in the right direction, give us the right pointers, shake us when we're asleep at the wheel, do whatever is necessary to help us in this most compassionate way. Well, not only as teachers, but then what they've created as far as this space, the Abbey. And the Abbey still permeates every place we are right now, even when we're in our own, own homes. So, uh, you know, that, that's one thing, and a pretty darn big thing at that that, might, that, that needs to happen. I think of uh, Tetsudo, he talked to me after the very first weekend uh, session that I did, and I don't know if I would come back or not, but he was really, really kind to me um, and, uh, and told me about uh, the uh, physical pain that he had experienced too, because I was in a lot of pain that first, that first weekend. And so I really uh, have just so great uh, appreciation for that. And then I think about my parents, and I think about all your parents, uh, the fact that they ever even got together, right? That's somewhat of a miracle. 
and then think of their grandparents, uh, your grandparents, and you know, go on and on and on, ancestors. All those folks, just if they wouldn't have gotten together at just the right time or whatever, uh, they they survived uh, at least the reproductive age uh, wars, uh, all kinds of things, diseases that could have happened, and any one of those things, and you wouldn't be here right now. Not to mention what things happened that had to happen in your life up to this point that we're all here today. So that's it's uh, quite wondrous, uh, that's for sure. Um, so I guess the the thing is that this week. Uh, let's take advantage. Let's let's go deeper, deeper in our practice. Let's support. Let's support each other, and just really, really take advantage of this opportunity. Well, uh, before we get into the rest of this talk, or really get into this talk, uh, I want to uh, share something from my business career. Um, when I when I worked in business, I worked for this a very large company. Uh, some of you know as Pepsi Cola, and uh, we uh, uh, we we had to write a lot. I was in IT. I worked in IT, and we we did lots of recommendations for IT infrastructure, how to connect connect the dots of all these different locations, uh, and can keep keep the business up and running uh, globally, you know, across across the uh, the whole world. And so one of the things we had to do is when we were working when we were doing recommendations is we more often than not have to do an executive summer for the senior executive team. So they could really understand what it was the heck that we were trying to focus on, right? And uh, my boss would say, okay, Kent, uh, you gotta, these were his words, not mine, you gotta dumb it down a little bit. The recommendation is like 25 PowerPoint things. Nobody's gonna read all that stuff. So simplify it and capture the spirit, capture the spirit of what it is you're recommending. Right, that's that's what's going to ultimately sell them on it or not. It's get, capturing the spirit. So, after being with that company for 31 years, I guess a little bit of that stuff stuck with me. So I'm thinking right now, okay, doing this doing this talk today, um, I'll try to do a little executive summary here, for really what the what is the nature of what I'm trying to convey today, and then we'll get into more of the specifics and some of the detail here in a moment. So. Here's, uh, here's my executive summary, uh, and it's who am I, again, the koan, who am I, and, but, and, and without, my, without my story, okay? No stories to tell, no stories to tell, no stories to tell, no stories to tell. He's such a great guy, no stories to tell. I heard he gets high, no stories to tell. She's such a jerk, no stories to tell. She steals pencils from work no stories to tell, just C, 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 no stories to tell, just B, 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 no stories to tell, no me, 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 no stories to tell, no she, no he, no we, no the, no stories to tell, no it at all, no stories to tell, no short, no tall, no stories to tell, no it, 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 no stories to tell, just sit, 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 no stories to tell, no me and you, no stories to tell, just practice on through, just practice on through, just practice on through, no stories to tell, not one, not two, no stories to tell, who is telling you, no stories to tell, of who am I, no stories to tell, let your fond opinions die, no stories to tell, no me, no you, no stories to tell, no who, 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 no stories to tell, no who, no I, no stories to tell, no I to live or die, just C, 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 and all will be. At heart, we all are free, free, free. So I want to share a few points with you today from my practice working on this koan, and still working on this koan. And these are points that have helped me. We're all different. We're all socialized differently. We've all had different uh, experiences in our life that have impacted us and affected us, joys, traumas, all kinds of things. But I'm gonna convey things that were helpful to me. Hopefully some of it will be helpful for you as well. One point, in working on who am I from, that I found really helpful is don't try and figure it out. 
don't try and figure it out. And uh, I was trained in science, and I like to figure things out. I like math, like to kind of figure that out. But in this case, it's not particularly helpful. Okay, we're going to do some of that probably, who, who doesn't, but, but it's not particularly helpful. When I first found out about Buddhism, and it was long before I ever sat with anybody, I never, I'd never meditated in my life at this point, but I picked up a book by the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama had a chapter in there, and it was called something like Ultimate Reality. He was pointing at emptiness. And so I was, uh, I, I read this book, and there was one that chat, that particular chapter really stood out to me. I was on a business trip. I was talking to a gentleman on my team, Bob, and I was telling him about how incredible this was reading this, reading about ultimate reality. And it had so it rocked my world and kind of challenged my way of thinking uh, as I read it. And I was trying to share it with him. And I said, but you know, there's one thing about this ultimate reality, about what's really going on here that the Dalai Lama was writing about that I don't quite get. I just don't get this one thing. And and it said in the book, too, that meditation was very important, that if you really wanted to have more of a, a real um, knowing, if you will, a deep knowing of what's going on, you had to meditate. I thought, you know, I don't want to meditate. I don't even know what that is, how to do that. But, uh, but I think I can get it, Bob. And he goes, well, that's, that's really cool. And he, he was interested in it, too. I mean, here we were at a business dinner, and we're talking about ultimate reality from the Dalai Lama's point of view. But anyway, so, so that was my first, my first kind of playing around with, with this with, uh, you know, with, with a, a really deep question, uh, and in this case about emptiness or ultimate reality. And uh, that, that wasn't particularly helpful. It was needed. It piqued my interest, but, but it certainly didn't really get me where I wanted, where I wanted to go, wherever that might be, okay? Um, and, and, and the point is, for my, in my experience, the thinking mind, the conceptual mind, the storytelling mind, that won't capture it. It just never will. In fact, when working with this koan, it's helpful to remember, it's not just who am I, it's who am I prior to thinking, prior to that first thought, who am I? And of course, this week, in our practice, we have the ability to really focus in on our zazen. Our zazen is a powerful way of practicing with this, with this koan. And we have that opportunity all this week um, and, and again, quite frankly, um, the, the intellectual study of sutras, reading books on Zana, I enjoy that. Wonderful pointers. I'm not saying there aren't, it's not, it can't be helpful, but that won't reach it, at least for me, it, it hasn't, it never did, you know. Uh, and the other point is about this don't figure it out is what if there really is no thing to figure out? What if there's really nothing to conceptualize? Just see. What if that's it? We just need to see. So if a belief or story comes up, we can just put that aside and just see. Just see what it is. And, but not see just with our eyes. That's just another concept. But with our nose, our touch, our skin, our fingernails, our hair, our glasses that are on our face. You know, we can see with our toothbrush. We can see, 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 you know, really, really see. And ultimately, we can see with our hearts, our wide open heart, shields down, just opening up a heart, we can see, see that way. But, you know, beware, if you will, because it's awfully easy to fall back into concepts again. I certainly <laughs> do that uh, frequently, right? But then I can catch myself and I can come back to, come back to seeing. I remember working on, uh, uh, on a, a very early koan and uh, I was working on it with, uh, with Roshi Shinko. And I had this presentation, and I really thought I had was this was going to pass this particular koan. So I present it to her, and she's like, "Oh no, no! This is before I'd gone through uh, Jukai, so she gets tense. No, that's you are going backwards. You are going backwards." And she was shaking her head like this. I'm like, "Okay, I think that probably is a pretty good sign that I'm not going to pass this koan." And then, and then she. Uh, you know, I, I got the message, though, about that I was way up in my head. I was way up in my head and, again, trying to figure this thing out. And even though maybe I passed another koan or something before this, I was still back to my old tricks of, of getting up in my head. So that was, you know, it's, it's, uh, that's always been a, a real challenge for me. A second, a second point I wanted to talk about from my experience is this idea of don't wait. Don't wait. 
When I got into Zen practice, I read a book. It's a book I love. Um, it was one of Joko's books. And, uh, but she said, you know, to really get this practice, you've got to practice for a long time. She said, 15 is super short. If you can kind of get what's going on in 15 years, that's, that's really short. For most of us, she said it takes 20, 25 years. So I was thinking, well, okay, 25 years, 20, that is probably about 25 years. I was, I think, I think I was 47 when I read that book. So I'm thinking, okay, 67, you know, maybe, maybe 72. I could, I could maybe understand what practice is about. I could sort of get it. You know, my, I'd be really, uh, kind of a rock solid, calm, Spock like guy, which is kind of what I equated at the time of somebody that was really, uh, together, really centered, the, would be acting kind of like, uh, kind of like Spock, right? So here I was thinking about this thing 20, 20 years or 25 years, 25 years hence that I, I sort of needed. I mean, I was going to work hard. I was going to do, uh, you know, I was going to sit and, 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 uh, and, and, and practice. But I, I did, did, did think that it, it'll really kick into gear after I've been doing this for, for over 20 years, something like that. So I thought of this practice, I thought of my, my practice as transactional. And why not? Raised in the world, I did. You know, you, you did stuff, you got something in return. This, this quid pro quo, uh, sorry for that, that phrase. It's kind of an ugly phrase to me now, nowadays. But anyway, a, a transactional thing anyway, that I would do this and then, and then get something else out of it. And who tells me that there's something to get? Where did I get that idea? My ego, okay? My ego tells me that. I want to get something if I'm going to do this. If I'm going to sit on my butt for hours a day, for a week, a couple of weeks a year, I want to get something out of that. I want to return in that, right? That's the way I, that's what I thought about it. And I uh, later was um, uh, reading a book that, uh, by Katagiri uh, Roshi. In fact, I heard one of his, uh, one of his uh, Dharma successors talk about this too that the category was asked to give a talk on uh, on uh, zazen and he happened to go he he was uh, with some other spiritual uh, teachers and they were of different traditions different lineages and things and they all talked about their spiritual practice and what they you know what they had uh, how it helped them and what it achieved for for themselves and their students in the world and that sort of thing so then it becomes category roshi's turn and, and he's talking, again, going to, going to be focusing on Zazen. So what does he say? He says, you know, Zazen is good for nothing. It's good for absolutely nothing. And I'm thinking like, wow, he just pulled the rug out from under everything, from, from everyone. I'm, I'm sure that's exactly what he, what he wanted to do. But he pulled out the rug from the kind of thinking that I had had um, from the, at the beginning of my practice around you know, wanting to get something out of Zazen, right? This, this transactional idea. And, but what if there is nothing to get? And perhaps what we already have, which is so precious, is no thing at all. You know, and this koan, this who am I prior to thinking, it can't be worked on in the future. It can't be worked on in the past. We can only realize this thing now. That's why I'm saying don't wait. You can only realize it now. Where else? Could the here now reality be, right, of what the heck's going on other than now? Why would we think we could look in the future, you know, for that? And as the Eno reminds us, every evening, you know, time swiftly passes by, an opportunity is lost, each of us should strive to awaken, awaken, take heed, do not squander your life, right? Do not squander your life. So this idea of not waiting, not waiting, that's squandering some time. That's sort of, you know, uh, uh, missing, missing, missing this very, very precious moment. So I guess the bottom line of this to me is don't wait 20 years to, to try to really uh, get in deep into your practice. Don't think it's going to take you that long. And in reality, it's, you, you can do it right now. You can do it absolutely right now. And um, also don't, don't wait till day five or day six this week, or don't wait till this afternoon even. For the next, for whatever the next period is, right? Just drop in and and uh, and be present and experience this now, 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 right now. Experience it now, right? When else are you gonna experience it? Um, another another thing that I wanted to share with you today is this this notion of don't add anything extra to this koan of who am I? This who am I before thinking? Because this practice 
it's really addition by subtraction. You don't need to add anything more there. You don't need to read a bunch of books. You don't need to read a lot, study a lot of sutras. You know, you got it covered because basically, uh, basically what this is, what you are, I am, everyone without exception is, is this precious, precious gem. You don't have to add anything. We've been adding stuff to it our whole lives, okay? Our whole lives. We need to start letting go and letting go and letting go and letting go, peeling back the proverbial onion, okay? Just peeling it back, back, back. It's like the third part patriarch says, don't seek after the truth. Just cease to cherish your opinions, your ideas. In fact, let go of anything we think we are, okay? Reminds me of that story about the sculptor, right? Um, this uh, gentleman comes up to the sculptor who had created this beautiful, beautiful sculpture out of stone of the Virgin Mary. And the gentleman said, how, the, how did you do that? It's just mind blowing. It brings me to tears. It's so beautiful. How did you create that? And then she, the artist, she says, she says, well, I just cut away everything that wasn't the Virgin Mary. I just cut away everything that wasn't the Virgin Mary. You know, that's our practice, right? We got to just keep letting go of everything, cutting away, lopping off all those parts of ourselves that we spent a lifetime cr creating. We created this sort of house of cards, this, this, this uh, mirage, if you will. And we can just keep cutting that away. And then we can see when we cut everything away, everything away, what is left? Cutting away all our precious stories, all our ideas, and all our concepts. One moment while I let my dog out of the room. He stayed for the executive summary, but he blew off the rest of the talk. Can't blame him. Anyway. Um, so letting go, letting go, letting go. That's the that's that's the uh, the, the the message on on that. As far as I'm concerned, another point that I struggled with a lot in my practice is this idea of being vulnerable, being vulnerable. You know, without vulnerability in my practice, it's like I'm living with blinders on. Okay. And but with when I'm vulnerable, when I let my guard down, when I tell you how scared I am or how sad I am or how depressed I am, or I openly share those kind of emotions, right? At times, I don't have to be indulgent, but just you know, I, I can be honest about what's going on in my mind. Um, then I, I can look into every nook and cranny without judgment, just, just experience it. You know, what am I so afraid of? What do I need to protect? What am I trying to hide from myself and others? I mean, did I really think that everyone else out here that I'm looking at on this screen, that you all don't have issues? That you don't have had neuroses and stuff like that? I'm, I'm guessing you probably have a few. You may not have as many as I do, but I bet you've got, I've got, bet you've got your share. Anyway, and whether you do or not, who cares? It's my life, I've got this stuff, I wanna be honest about it, okay? Um, and, and, you know, I've seen certainly and sit from, from spending time on a cushion over time that what I'm trying to do is protect this image that I've constructed over the years and this thing that I don't want anyone else to see. I mean, it's really a facade and you all know it. Any of you that know me well, you're aware, aware of challenges that I have, right? And I'm aware of it, but I still don't want it to be shown to the world a lot of times, right? I, it's like I, I don't want to do that. And, and what is that? That's some stuff that maybe I can't quite accept about myself yet. So I want to hide it. I don't accept it. I don't want anybody else to even be aware of it. And that is, is, uh, is, is, can be a huge challenge. And one of the reasons it can be a huge challenge, particularly as Zen practitioners is, if we're doing that, we can rationalize the fact that we don't have this issue. So this challenge or this, this tendency, you know, it's like for me, let's just take the example of, of being anxious. Okay. Ang I've had anxiety, right? In my life that I've dealt with. And, and what, I, my, what I might do is 
let's say that something this week comes up and I'm like, oh, and I'm, I, I'm anxious sitting on the cushion, something comes up. Well, okay, I could say, you know, I've been practicing now for a bunch of years that's bogus. I, I don't, that's not, that's just some fluky thing. That's not really what I am at all in this moment. I'm not, I'm not really anxious and just kind of stuff it. Just go on to something else, distract myself and, and, and get out of that, get out of that somewhat. Okay. And, uh, but when I do that, and particularly as a Zen student, where I'm trying to see truth, I'm trying to really experience this here now reality. When I push that aside stuff, but whatever I, I might do, which at times in my life has been, has been helpful. You know, I don't want to, I didn't want to be given some presentation at work and like, you know, freak out and have, a, have an anxiety attack. Okay. So, so sometimes having some techniques to not necessarily stuff it, but deal with it uh, more uh, in a more healthy way that I'm, I'm not minimizing that, but what I'm getting at is I want to be able to look clearly at what's going on at some level. Right. And rather than try to convince myself that it's not me. So what I'm, what I'm aiming for, trying to do in my practice is to look whatever it is that's a challenge for me, whether it's grief, depression, anxiety, fear, you know, joy, whatever it is, look it straight in the eye. Look it straight in the eye. Remember our friend Soten that some of us know from, uh, from practicing with him for years, you know, right, right, not long before he died, he said, he said, he gave this Dharma talk as he put it, you know, I'm going to look, look death straight uh, straight in the eye straight in the eye that's it right that that's that to me is the spirit is that looking whatever we're dealing with straight in the eye and and Pema Chodron uh you know makes this point I, lo I, I love this analogy about taking off our armor you know we've built we put all these layers on in our life and it gets to be like armor it's a, it's it's a buffer between us and 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 some of the stuff that we have to deal with and we can start we can start taking that armor off it can, be, it can be scary to take that off, but that's what our practice can help us do, see through it, and then expose, open up more and more and more. This idea of opening up our heart, for most of us, it's probably not something we just, wow, just now I can open. It may happen to some people, it sure does. So I know it does for some people, but, but for a lot of us, it's an incremental thing, an incremental thing of opening up more and more and more until our shields come down, right? Like in Star Wars, they let the shields down. We can just totally totally open up but nobody can remove that armor for us but we all have a great opportunity this week in particular we can do it at any time but we have a really really wonderful opportunity being in session and the support of each other support of our teachers to take some more of that armor off another thing i was uh, got really stuck in in my practice and i still it's a challenge of course is this notion of uh, Prajnaparamita, the other shore, the shore of the awakened. And, uh, you know, this was where I wanted to get, this is where I wanted to get, I wanted to get the proverbial land of uh, milk and honey or whatever. And, uh, but, but what about this other shore? Again, it was something separate from me that was, ooh, it's like over here somewhere. You know, I keep talking about the here now reality, but this, this other shore, by, by the, just the, the, the name of it itself, it, it seems like something that's apart. And I certainly thought of it as something apart from me that I had to get to, but maybe, you know, someday, someday I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to get there sort of thing. And I grew up uh, in Oregon, where I spent 10 years in Oregon when I, was a, when I was a kid. And, you know, I spent a fair amount of time on the beach in Oregon. I built a lot of sandcastles with my brother, right? And when the tide would be out, we'd build these sandcastles and, you know, sometimes fairly, fairly ornate, I thought. And, uh, and then, and then, you know, we, <laughs> we'd come back later and the tide had come in and whoa, uh, you know, either we couldn't even see it because they were underwater or when it, when, it, when the tide uh, then did rescind enough that we could see it, uh, the, the castle was gone, right? The castles were gone. So, you know, like, like building these, uh, these, these sand castles, the shorelines, I mean, that, that taught me they're, they're pretty impermanent. The other thing I can remember is waiting in the Pacific Ocean and when, and when the wave would go back out, just feeling all this sand rushing between my toes. I love that feeling. I, I'd hang out there for a long time just to experience it. And the sand would just come back out through my toes. And it was like, it was so cool. I, I love the feeling. And it was also though a sign of the fact that this, this shoreline is certainly not fixed. It's certainly not fixed. It's very dynamic. It's ebbing. It's flowing all the, all the time. Um, so again, even from that standpoint, kind of this metaphor of the other shore, 
the, the other shore can be, uh, it's, it's not fixed. It, it's what can be washing away and then coming back. Um, but again, the similar notion to what I was talking about earlier, that this other shore, what if it's right here? What if it's been right here all along? What if all we really have to do is just live this life, this life, including when I'm uh, anxious or fearful or you are or sad or depressed or whatever, that that, that that being able to open up our heart to that, not be separate from that, is, is this, we'll call it other shore, when it's really no other at all, right? And, you know, that really we can just live this awakened life that we already are without exception, without exception, right? You know, the fourth uh, Bodhisattva vow, we, we chant it, you know, every day, unsurpassable enlightened way I vow to manifest. We can do that. It is our vow. The pressure's off. Just live it. Just embrace it. Whatever comes up, whatever unknown stuff comes up now, it's not easy. It can be very scary. We, we can do that. That's part of our practice. We can open up to the extent we're able to open up right now. And that'll be perfect. And then we can just keep doing it. And then over time, we can open up a little more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then we're freaking really open up. What a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful thing that is. What a loving thing that is. Just anyway. Um, but a thing is that living this on this other shore, experiencing this other shore that is right here, you know, that sitting, walking, sleeping, this this awakened life, and but also really, nothing is outside of that. But that also means, you know, if you don't want to get real political here, but if depending upon what you think about Donald Trump or not, that, that he's part of the other shore. COVID is part of the other shore. Death addiction birth happiness sorrow love joy that's all the other shore right and that just they're really neutral so we tell these stories about it right they can just they're just neutral it's, yeah okay another point is is uh this idea of, and I, I referenced this a bit earlier but don't judge don't judge now we all judge we're human we judge so what, what do i even mean by that well um, again, I was talking to uh, uh, a, a good friend of mine in the, in the Sangha, and, uh, and we were talking about, about judging. And he said, he said to me, um, this was Soten again, the conversation with him, and he said, we were talking about judgment and judgment in our practice and dealing with it. And he said, you know, he goes, life's too short. It's just too short to spend time judging. And he, goes, he said, you know, it comes from the illusion of separation. And I said, okay, yes, but you tell me you don't you don't ever judge? I think I've seen you judge. Of course, I was being judgmental when I said that. And he and he and he said he said, yeah, I do judge, I do judge. Try not to a whole lot, but I do judge some. But at least I don't judge myself anymore for judging. Okay, we just don't have to judge ourselves for judging right now. Just having that awareness. Just having that awareness. Which brings me to the last point about things I really wanted to, to share and for my practice is be, and I think this probably trumps everything, <laughs> be compassionate with ourself, with yourself, with myself. Be compassionate. How compassionate? Is that going to be indulgent? Well, however compassionate you think it is, that's too much, go beyond that. Okay, that's what I try to do with myself. When I think I'm being too compassionate for myself, too forgiving for myself, too understanding of my challenges, whatever you might be even some would call flaws, I'm gonna accept that and I'm willing to accept more, okay? I wanna talk just a little bit about uh, one of my very, I guess it's kind of goofy to say one of my favorite koans, but I'll say it anyway, because it is. Uh, case number 98 from the Book of Equanimity, right? Tozan stake heed. And uh, a monk asks Tozan, among the three bodies, which one does not fall into any 
category. Sozon replied, as to this, I always take heed. As to this, I always take heed. And as Shishin Roshi writes in his commentaries in the Book of Equanimity, the three bodies are the three bodies of the Buddha. And I'm not going to discuss these three bodies in detail here, but many of you are familiar with them, the Dharmakaya, the Sambhogakaya, and the Nirmanakaya. And um, the uh, Dharmakaya is, is, uh, is, is referred to like as a, the body of the Dharma, or Buddha nature itself. Uh, the Sambhogakaya, this idea of this ecstasy of enlightenment. And then the Nirmanakaya, this earthly body in which uh, Buddhas appear. So as, as Roshi says in his commentary, to even in that question the monk is asking, to even attempt to divide reality into three, three separate things, to fragment it like that, and then ask which one doesn't fall in any category, he references a, 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 another a master who said, that's like a cat pissing in your house, okay? Cats pissing in your house. I mean, how are you even supposed to answer that question? Because it's, it's, it's an out there question. It's, it's missing the point. So what's the appropriate response? Well, as Tozan said, just take heed. You know, if the cat pisses in your house, you're going to clean up the piss, right? Just taking heed. But Tozan, Tozan doesn't say he sometimes takes heed. He says, as to this, I always take heed. I always take heed. Not when he feels good. Not when he feels pain-free. Not when he feels, you know, does he take freed? He do, not does he not take heed when he has any of those conditions. He always takes heed. He does take heed when he feels cruddy or he feels sick or he feels painful. He always takes heed. He does feel to take heed when he feels joyous or happy, ebullient, whatever he feels. He's always taking heed, always taking heed. You're sickened with lies from the leaders of our country. Take heed. What is it? What's going on there? Your best friend dies in an accident. What's that? You find you have bone cancer. You find you have bone cancer. Yeah, take heed. You struggle with panic attacks. Take heed. You struggle sitting on the cushion. You don't want to today. Take heed. You're cocky. You're arrogant. Take heed. You have too much humility, if there's such a thing. Take heed. You have not enough humility. Take heed. You think this session is boring. Take heed. You think this talk is boring. Take heed. You think this talk is marvelous. Take heed. So when brushing my teeth, who am I? When peeing, who am I? When pooping, what's that? When cleaning toilets, what's that? When making meals, who am I? Eating meals, what's this? Feeling pain, crying, laughing, sitting, supporting each other, what is it? When I feel depressed, alone, heartbroken, happy, joyous, uncertain, confident, arrogant, we can take heed and receive all of this. That is our life of the Buddha. That is our awakened life. So let's practice together. Let's support each other. Let's go deeper and deeper with our practice. And when we think there is no place more to penetrate, no place more, everything's been dropped off. Let's go beyond that. Let's go beyond that. So what an opportunity we have in this Rohatsu. And this opportunity which is so marvelous that we have, it will never exist again. It's just now. It's just now. I want to close with uh, some of Dogen's writing from uh, Shobhagenzo. To study Buddha is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be enlightened by the 10,000 dharmas. To be enlightened by the 10,000 dharmas is to free one's body and mind and those of others. 
no trace of enlightenment remains. And this traceless enlightenment is continued forever. So let's keep going. 